when I was like six years old, he would say, go to the grocery store. We need these five things. Now, can you imagine that happening today? Those tests of independence, that is being sent out into that world to accomplish a task. Once you can do that as a kid, you build that independence that you can take on almost anything. What is up, everybody? Ed Gow Jr. here from Dad Central and the Dad Central Show. And my fellow blue guy today is yeah. here. <laughs> Drew Solon of Dad Central and the Dad Central Show rocking the blue hoodie with my yeah. man, Ed. Yeah, so, and, and, yeah. when we're recording Great this, minds think alike is what I have to say go. today. And by the way, I know we're recording this during the March Madness NCAA men's and women's basketball. I'm not a big fan of North Carolina. So when I don't know, I can't speak for Drew. I'm not a Tar Heel by heart. Yeah, well, your your sweater would say otherwise. So. Yes, I know. <laughs> I got it. I got we'll it. Just say you're a confused fan right now. <laughs> I re received, received, received. What's been going on? Well, you know, you know how I am about kids and cell phones. And somebody sent me something the other day, and uh, yeah, I'll never miss an opportunity to talk about it, but this is really, is, I think it's dramatic, and I think it really speaks to it. So it's a post on Instagram, probably won't be able to see it, but I'll, I'll read briefly. And it's uh, showing a graph of self-harm rates of U.S. children aged 10 to 14. And as you can imagine, the graph is relatively flat over the, the previous years. It starts in like 2000, uh, let's see, 2002, and yep. it goes up to 20. And then as it's going along... It, there's a dramatic peak. And so this is the caption that says, new article in at the Atlantic by me out today. My claim is that the new phone-based childhood that took shape roughly 12 years ago is making young people sick and blocking their progress to flourishing in adulthood. adulthood. We need a dramatic cultural correction and we need it now. And as I said, the self-harm rates were like skyrocketing uh, over the last uh, from 2018. Well, no, actually starting in 2012, the, it, it's dramatic, right? It's one of those things, that, that curve. So um, not to be alarmist, because that's not my point. But I think that parents often miss the importance of this key piece. And so I just wanted to share that brief tidbit, because you know how I feel about yeah. the technology and the cell phone yeah. in particular and the challenge yeah um let's get to this and we'll just continue that on for a second before we have our new friend up here so the dove no it's a dove the dad central show is sponsored by dove men plus care i was gonna say no i got dove on my mind don't worry dove men plus care dove men plus care believes that care is the best of a man because when men care for themselves and others there's a positive impact and i just want to add on to that it was interesting I was doing a session for some people the other day. And one of the gentlemen said, oh, this thing, food insecurity, food insecurity, you hear that term a lot now, especially pandemic and post pandemic. But he also said, you know what? There's also a social insecurity. Hmm. And this is, in my opinion, one of the parts that's contributing to the social insecurity. Yeah, I would agree, 100%. You know, just, a, just, just a thought. But we are excited. We have a new friend for y'all today, and I'm going to have Drew do the introduction, and this going to be good. Get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> it is going to be good. And one of the, I guess, privileges of being able to do this show is that, you know, often we get connected with people that, you know, see and find the show and say, hey, we like what you're doing. We'd love to get connected. And this guest is one of those who's found us and reached out and uh, seeing what, who we're going to talk to. I, I think you're going to you're going to have a great um, you're going to enjoy this. So we have Jeff Nelligan on the show today and he is the father of three boys he's also a well-known commentator in the world of american parenting his most recent book is the second edition of four lessons from my three sons how you can raise resilient kids in which he outlines his parenting techniques and the path of his sons through childhood and adolescence to the u.s naval academy williams college and west point you know the first edition was a subject of feature stories on national public radio and in dozens of parenting publications including parents magazine fatherly young teen magazine the good men project ed you know them well fatherhood and let grow so jeff is currently a public affairs executive in washington dc and he formerly worked for three members of the u.s congress and served twice as a presidential appointee he's an army veteran 
Uh, he's of Polynesian ancestry, a Maori Indian in New Zealand, and a graduate of Williams College and Georgetown University Law School. So uh, we're excited. Jeff, welcome to the show. We can't wait to uh, learn more about your story and help our listeners be able to apply your wisdom to help them raise resilient kids. So thanks for being here. Hey, thanks, Drew. Thanks, Ed, for having me here. This is, you know, it's a privilege. You guys run a, a site that I wish was, you know, beyond Canada in terms of its reach and reach down to the United States because I've been on many, many parenting sites in, in the last decade, and you guys seem to have just about encapsulated everything a new dad or a dad of 10 years needs to know about kids. And, you know, I'll begin this whole this interview just by saying what you what you said in your introductory video to announce the podcast, you know, the absolute power of a father's presence in a kid's life. And that is that's the foundation of the book that I wrote for lessons for my three sons and the foundation of my parenting. That presence, that engagement and how essential that is to raising that kid you want. Hmm. What a great message. And that's why we're so excited for this conversation. I really want to get uh, a little bit of insight into you know how you've even came to that uh, and then, then now delivered on that, obviously as a father, but um, also now as helping others and helping other fathers and helping other parents to do that. So you know, we love in the show to get a little bit of the backstory, if you yeah. if you would. And so can you tell us a little bit more about you know, Jeff growing up and, um, you know, what life was like for you then and how that sort of led to, you know, before you even became a father. Certainly. I grew up in Los Angeles. I was born in Santa Monica, California, and had an idyllic childhood and preteen and adolescence. My parents were engaged, were as engaged as I wanted to be later on when I became a father. I came east for school and then kicked around in journalism for a little while and then entered, which always what was my goal was politics and got a job in the House of Representatives and then just moved up the ladder as as politics is. And that is, if you don't win, lose too many times, you're, you're winning um, because everyone loses at some point. And finally became uh, the most important thing, finally became a dad at rather you know, a, a great point working on the Hill and just bounce from political job to political job. And of course, nothing, you know, no one just runs through fields of grass. I mean, I've, I've lost my job several times because of being on the South side of an election, but was always able to recover. And then finally came to work in DC as a, um, as a career federal uh, executive in the executive branch, which is where I am today. Along the way, had three sons uh, who, you know, from the beginning, I approached with a strategy. And I think that's the essential message for all the dads listening right now. I, the idea of having a strategy for raising your kid instead of having the culture raise your kid. And Drew mentioned that earlier about that Instagram post, um, and we can get into that later, but that that is key for a dad to have that strategy. Again, that presence in your kid's life. I want to jump in. You said strategy. What was your dad's strategy raising you? It was, I, I would say it was the mirror of what I tried to accomplish with my sons. Uh, my dad did everything with all three of us. I was the eldest of three and uh, he was a music executive in Los Angeles and a college professor. But, you know, it, I can symbolize it by one thing, you know, I'm in a eighth grade basketball game and it's the first game of the season. And I look up in the stands and there's my dad sitting there in a suit and tie, just watching the game. I didn't even get off the bench for more than 10 minutes. And at the end of the game, he came up, shook my hand, and then, you know, wandered out of the gym. I saw him, obviously, later at home. And he had driven 45 miles from downtown L.A. to our high school out in Woodland Hills to watch, uh, you know, 
an hour and 15 minutes of a basketball game in which his kid got 10 minutes and then drove all the way back to Los Angeles to continue his job and then finally came home like around eight o'clock at night. That, that was the kind of presence that uh, I was so fortunate to have for my father. And I was determined that my kids would have the same kind of presence in their lives. Wow. Drew? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes sense having shared that story about how powerful and important the message of presence is because you've lived it. And um, maybe you could just talk briefly about this. And you know, what did that, what message did that give to you when you, you would witness your father doing those types of things to be present in your life? Well, the engagement was so, was so important because he, he was intent like I was, you know, 30 years later on raising raising his children not leaving it up to you know the wiles of the, of the culture but it also showed that uh you know I don't want to get too smarmy here but you know the love that he had for us and he did the same thing for my sister and my brother and that this was just a casual thing there was no big deal made about it and that that kind of closeness persists throughout throughout childhood and so when you're with your father and with my mom, too, my mom was the same way. You tend to mirror what they do because they've shown you this as an example of what the right kind of behavior should be. So you become in them making that reflex decision that if they ask you to do something, you do it because they've shown these examples previous about how much they care for you. So that example that reflex, that muscle memory just imbues you throughout the rest, as I say, preteen, adolescence, and then through my college experience and beyond, even in politics, that you just know what the right thing to do is most of the time, if not all the time. And hopefully you can follow through most of the time, if not all the time. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you for that. You know, Ed picked up on it and you shared it very clearly. You know, you had a strategy. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how your strategy emerged and how, like, when did you become aware of your own strategy or did it just happen organically? You know, it's a great question. When do you become aware of it? You know, maybe I'm different, but I'll tell you, I think every dad has this experience. You know, you hold that kid in your arms, you know, three hours or four hours after their birth. And then throughout those first months, you know, you're constantly attending to them. And you reach a point, you say, what do I want this kid to be? You know, what, what is going to be the future for this child? It, you know, is it going to be great things, good things, bad things? No one knows at that age. So the idea then is you put together a plan, a strategy, so that you can help guide that, that child, he or her, you know, to the right markers of life and that strategy began really early on. And the number one element really of the strategy is getting that kid into the real world. You know, some of your previous guests talk about the real world on your, on the, on the podcast. It's kind of tough. ADHD, um, parents who were pretty much 180 degrees from what my parents were. So, you know, the world, <laughs> it's an unforgiving place. My key strategy was getting my kids out into the real world, you know, because I have this old fashioned belief there, <laughs> Drew and Ed, you know, our job as parents, as dads, is not just to form a relationship with our kid. It's to have to teach our kid to form a relationship with the real world out there. That is the people and the places, the situations, the challenges the victories. And once a kid can handle himself in the real world, that's that's what a parent can hope for. Because after the age of 13, pretty much the majority of that kid's time with you has been spent. And the real world is going to be his or hers for the rest of their lives. Let me come back to you and your dad. When did he, what sort of exposure to the real world did he give you or put you in? Oh, 
when 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 I was like six years old, he would say, go to the grocery store. We need these five things. And the grocery store was a bike ride away across, you know, Ventura Boulevard in San Fernando Valley. And at six years old, I'm getting on a bike and riding half a mile, getting the stuff at the market and driving back on a bike. Now, can you imagine that happening today? I it's don't impossible. think so. <laughs> six years old. You know, wow. back back in the day, you know, you went and bought the Sunday paper. Every Sunday, I was on my bike at about eight o'clock in the morning, driving to the supermarket to buy the Sunday paper. So those tests of independence, that is being sent out into that world to accomplish a task among all these strange, you know, individuals and strange places. Once you can do that as a kid, you build that independence that you can take on almost anything. Drew, go ahead. For many reasons. I love that story. Um, but I also want to, maybe add a little to it and then get your perspective, Jeff. Sure. So part of the research around, uh, the, you know, Dad Central was created and we've got a program actually called Super Dad, Super Kids relates to a child's willingness or ability to go out into the world and explore and that fathers are actually catalysts for risk-taking behaviors. But yeah. we have to add this though. It, it isn't, it's, it's not just, you know, push your kid out into the world because you do need the relationship where they feel loved, they feel accepted, they feel connected. So I just wanted to throw that out there because again, the research is pretty clear that when you have a father who has that warm connected relationship, they actually are catalysts and help children feel secure enough they can go out into the world and do those types of things. What are your thoughts on that? Does it align that's, with your experience? That's a great point. And I love the word you use catalyst, Drew, because the, the father, the dad, the mom is that catalyst. Instead of the kid, you know, shaken or scared to say, no, I can't do that. With that warm dad, and you use that term, that catalyst is formed. And I did the same thing with my kids, you know, the ages, ages of seven to four, we were in a, this was our, my usual example because we did it all the time in a huge shopping mall indoor. And I pull out my wallet and give each kid five buck, a $5 bill and say, go get change. It's not a race. And I'm going to try and keep my eye on you. You know, this is an in, we're not in the middle of the desert and you come back with a change and I trust you to do the right things. And of course it's a task. It's a challenge. And the right kind of kid loves a challenge. And of course they struck out Two of them struck out the first store they went into. Another kid came back with 20 quarters, but they all returned. And, you know, that was the beginning of being that catalyst. The dad, the dad's standing there saying, hey, big smile on my face. You know, just you take your time. And of course, then it graduates. It graduates to you go to a sketchy 7-Eleven and you give a kid a $20 bill and you say, hey, go in there and get, you know, Gatorade and Doritos and we'll be right here. And the kid has to go in and navigate the counter, finding this stuff, being around other individual strangers, and then come back to the car. And the kid does that when he's five years old. And then, of course, it graduates even more. You know, here's our here's the airline information. Go get our boarding passes. Here's my ATM card. Here's the passcode. Go get me 300 bucks. And so that catalyst, the kid goes off and does these things because Drew and Ed, you know, parents aren't around for the majority of the day of a kid. The kid is going to be at school or after school, and he's going to be with his peers or in different places. And the dad or the mom is not going to be there. So that kid has to have that confidence in order to carry on. And that confidence just swells and gets bigger and bigger and becomes like I said, the muscle memory for their, for every act that they do in life. I need to jump in here. Um, there's two words out of the many you just shared that I want you to provide insight and the importance for dads and fathers when it comes to their kids, trust and confidence. Yeah. 
how how foundational are those in that dad's relationship with their their child, their kids, etc.? Uh, you know, uh, Ed, let me take the second one on confidence. You know, let me tell you, um, and you guys know this because all adults know it. No one gets a free ride ever. And kids hit obstacles, you know, beginning at age three or four. And if they're able to be trained in a certain way and, and given trust, to use the second word, to do things on their own, that confidence conversely will only grow. And the confidence, as I said, is got to be a part of their everyday life because every day provides a challenge. Every day provides an obstacle that they've got to get over or around and, you know, somehow break through. So the two, the trust that they've been shown in getting it done and the confidence that they learn from doing it, and then that that confidence becomes that reflex later down the line. True. Yeah, uh, that's great. And I really want to do get into some more of the, you know, that, that building the confidence. Um, I think that's a great principle in terms of being able to give some of the trust and as, as they're given these tasks. Um, I, I've really enjoyed this idea of preparing our children to, I'm going to use this word, contribute, whether yeah. that's contribute as part of the family, contribute as part of their team, contribute as part of, you know, um, a team or contribute into the world. Because I feel like that's what you're, what you're teaching in these examples of giving them a challenge and going out is you're preparing them to learn how to contribute and use some of their talents and skills. So that's one thought. The other thought is the importance of you know, um, you know, personal development is a big part of my life, something that I, I believe in. And this idea that growth never happens in our comfort zone. It oh, always right. happens outside of our comfort zone. And what you are teaching with this principle here, what you're talking about is you are putting your children intentionally outside of their comfort zone, but in a structured, um, safe way where they can also get some immediate feedback as well as confidence boost in terms of, hey, I've done something uncomfortable, but I've shown myself that I can do it. So I just wanted to just say that these, to me, are really foundational and important, but I love with the idea of contribution. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and how that fits into like your strategy and what you were thinking? Sure, you know, uh, one of the things that I pushed early with the kids was athletics. Uh, and it started at four years old with soccer, which pretty much every kid in the universe starts with. And I just, I wanted them on a field because the, the contribution, the, that's a perfect word. They have to contribute if they're going to play the sport. It, you know, it, that's why they call it a team sport. So the idea of sp sports is, you get three things from it. If it's four, you know, four-year-old soccer or professional rugby, like my youngest kid plays today here in the United States. Number one, you have the camaraderie of a team. So you've got to contribute, to use your word, to that. You have to get along with people you don't even like, but you've got to do it. And it's very similar for, you know, when you're in the, the military, you know, you're with a company or you're on a ship and you've got to get along with everybody, even if you don't like them. The second part of it is adversity. You, you know, at the end of a game, and I played in a million games, as have all three of my sons all the way through college. There's a scoreboard up there and it says, you know, there's no time on the clock and there's a winner up there and there's a loser. And you don't want to be on that losing side. So you're going to try to get better. That adversity hurts. Losing hurts. And if it doesn't hurt, you shouldn't be playing. The third part of it is you have to get better. You, to, In order to contribute to that team, that camaraderie that was number one, number three, you have to continue to practice. You said the word self-improvement. You have to get better because if you don't, you're not going to be playing too long on the field or you're not going to make the next level team. So the contribution factor is spurred by outside forces, but it also comes from within. And the athletic metaphor is pretty tired, 
but it's the same as in a theater production or a marching band or in a robotics club, anything where kids are brought together, where there's a, you know, there's a specific goal at the end of the line that they have to work towards and achieve. So that contribution factor just kind of accelerated and escalated until the natural outgrowth of it was joining the service and two were in the Navy and one is in the army and all three are officers. And that's kind of the, right now that's where they are. And I think beyond that, if when they get out, um, it'll be the corporate realm where you have to motivate a huge team to get to a goal. And if you don't do it well enough, you're on that side of the scoreboard that's a loss. And, you know, putting up with too many of those is just not, is just not going to make it. Are you a dad who feels like you're juggling a million things at once? Balancing work, family, and personal goals can be overwhelming. But what if there was a solution? That's why we created our new fatherhood community called Dad Mentor. For over 20 years, Dad Central has built practical tools to help dads. We understand the challenges you face and provide the support you need to thrive. The biggest complaint we hear from dads is there's no dedicated support for their specific needs, but not anymore. Our new community called Dad Mentor is here to transform your fatherhood experience. Imagine feeling in control, staying calm and patient when your children misbehave. Picture yourself connected to your children, guiding them with confidence and watching them succeed. When you join Dad Mentor, you'll have access to a community of like-minded dads committed to their dad journey just like you. You'll also get the Dad's Roadmap. This is a step-by-step -step plan to help you go from unsure to unstoppable as a dad. Monthly masterclasses and Q&A sessions. You'll get answers and know exactly what to do straight from experts. Monthly group meetups that connect dads over common topics. A dad's resource library. Curated webinars, podcasts, or guides built by Dad Central to help you grow as a parent. And finally, you'll also get exclusive members-only offers and events. Now, many dads do try to do this father thing alone, only to find themselves trapped in frustration and strained relationships. Then they may turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms like drugs, alcohol, or other distractions, leaving their family and their own well-being at risk. We don't want you to reach that point of regret. Take steps to invest in you and your family today. Join Dad Mentor and go from stressed tired and overwhelmed to confident, calm, and connected. Join us today by going to dadcentral.ca forward slash dads. I want to ask all three of your sons and yourself are serving your country. How has that impacted your fatherhood with you serving your country, your three sons serving your country? How has that impacted you and your fathering of your sons, the service aspect, because it seems that you've driven that service aspect into your sons. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I was in the army, I was just in the army reserve and guard. I wasn't anything like, you know, the real, the true heroes who are the active duty types for years and years and years. Um, you know, I think one of the characteristics that they, they developed over the time as we went into this real world in the ups and downs. And, you know, and again, I you know want to emphasize none of this, none of their childhoods and the fathering, not all of it was just roses and champagne and unicorns. There were some tough times um, when they, they didn't meet the mark or when frankly, I didn't meet the mark. And I'll tell you in four lessons, there's plenty of times where I take some major league shots at myself for my mistakes. Um, I will say that the leadership portion of all the characteristics that resulted in the leadership portion, um, that was a big part of it. And they, they got those traits pretty much from being in athletics in a big way and being good enough to continue to ascend to other levels. I'll also say, you know, uh, my ex deserves 90% of the credit for how they turned out. Um, I get 10% for being, you know, a major league nag, but she had that quality of leadership. And so that helped with in the whole formation of their characters. 
And the service is really, you know, it's an ultra, you know, ultimate contribution type of affair. I would say alongside of that are teachers at any level, because that's the, that's the toughest job in Canada or in America that I know of. And first responders, it's a whole different realm of people who have kind of much, pretty much, you know, their servant leadership is the term, you know, they've decided to take these kind of rough jobs because that's just ingrained in them. I want to go a little bit deeper on that in regards to the service. And if you can send a share a message to the fathers, dads, and the male caregivers out there, how important it is for them to, especially in the early years, be a servant to their children. Yeah, I agree. It goes back to, you know, your introductory video, you know, the, the essence of engagement, you know, that presence in someone's life. Um, the parent that is not sitting there on their phone scrolling, you know, constantly while they're, while their kids are doing the same thing. Um, that, that parent who really understands that it's up to them, that the kid's childhood, the kid's destiny, and that, let's face it, that's what it is. A bad parent will turn out a bad kid every day of the week. A good parent will turn out a great kid all the time. And that's every aspect of from morning, waking them up to putting them in the rack at the end of the day, just being there. And that physical being there without, without some crazy device in your, in your hand is, is monumental. I mean, I would, we would literally half an hour every night, no matter what night of the week it was, I would just take the boys around the block, just walk them and say, Hey, what do you got to say? Every weekend, I'd take a kid out to the most peaceful place on the planet, which is a high school bleachers at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, and just say, hey, what's going on? Let's talk. And they knew that was part of the routine. Every Saturday, one or two of them was going to go out there with me, and they would have to fill the air. And we got to really get to know each other if we hadn't during the week about what was going on. And I'll tell you, they still, those meetings at the high school gym on a Saturday at eight still continue today. One of my kids just got back from a big deployment in the Far East for, gosh, 11 months. He came home before shipping off to his next uh, port of duty. And we were on the, we were in the damn bleachers at eight o'clock in the morning that Saturday, just shooting the breeze about what he'd seen, what he'd done. So it's always that that physical interaction, personal interaction, and just, you know, the looseness of being able to talk to your kid and win their confidence. Drew? Uh, I love your anecdotes because in those short little examples of what you've done, there's so much depth. And so, but the story really kept captivates me. And I think, man, you know, that's, that's so cool. And, and some a dad could be like, Hey, I'm going to do that. So I love the the practicality of it as well. Um, but I think um, what I'd love to, uh, you've been sharing probably elements of it. Would you be able to just lay out for the listeners and us, like what exactly was your strategy? Can you sure. just simply walk it out for us so that we can get a sense and then we can maybe then move on to how you went about executing that strategy? You bet. The strategy is simple and it's, and I'm not original. These, this is 5,000 years of this, you know, from the earliest Egyptians all the way to, you know, Joe Snuffy the Ragman today. It is the first one was personal courtesy. I wanted kids who I could take in front of any adult or any other kid who were dressed properly, who would shake their hand, who, who were always on time, who had nice things to say and who were just models of behavior. And one of the reasons, one of the ways I accomplished that was by pointing out every time we saw a jackass kid or adult, that that was not the way to behave. And I would say it, and I, we'd say it again and again, and again, the muscle memory kicks in. We're all four together. We see, we see something good, a senior, a kid, a guy opening a door for a senior. That's great behavior. We see, you know, a parent talking to shy parents just to get them going. Great behavior. 
we see a jackass kid who's leaving a field with his mom and dad holding all his gear and he's walking 10 feet ahead, texting furiously on his phone. That's a jackass. And you never want to be like that. You know, I'm going to hold you to it. So that idea of personal courtesy and conduct is is essential. That's the building block. Second one, confidence. You know, we've kind of gone over it. Give them tests in the in the real world that they can achieve, feel good about, and build that confidence more and more and more every day. The third thing was it just resilience and adversity. I said it earlier, you know, we were talking about it. No one gets a free ride. Everyone gets hit. And I remember losing my job after a bad election. You know, I was a campaign advance man and an appointee and I lost my job and the kids were, we were all at the football field on a Sunday with a bunch of other kids and parents. And I was about to throw one, one last, you know, rainbow downfield to junior. And I said, yeah, we'll go get those donuts. And the young, the eldest kid goes, dad, we can't afford donuts. You lost, you got fired from your job, you know, just shrieked at me. And I said, you know what, man, it's the end of the world. And he just looked at me and I said, let's have a seat at my office on the 50 yard line. I said, listen, guys, I lost my job. Yeah, but I'm going to get another one. I'll rally. It's not that big of a deal in the scheme of things. We're going to get through it. So yeah, it's really the end of the world. Ha ha ha. And they use that constantly when they ran into adversity, you know, whether it be spilling like a half a gallon of milk on the floor or getting an F or getting yanked from a game, whatever it was, it gave them kind of a momentary, you know, respite and kind of saving face. So the uh, building that up that every time they were in a scene, they, they'd seen the old man handle it pretty well so they could handle it well now too. And the last thing is just the ambition, you know, ambition in this country, kids that, Really, you know, my my middle kid once said it to me in eighth grade. He said, you know, Dad, good is not good enough. I thought, what the hell is this? This sounds like a 35-year-old man. And But that's just the way he'd been trained. You know, the idea is, yeah, that's good, but I just want something more. And again, I made an example of myself. I, Where we live in Washington, D.C. at the time, we were surrounded by all these office buildings and office parks, these, you know, huge, faceless, soulless, concrete and steel and brick and glass, you know, monoliths. And we were driving around and I said, guys, I want to make a point here. You see all these buildings we drive by all the time? I said, in every one of them, there's a guy in some office with a picture of the family on his desk and a mug, you know, coffee mug like you made me in second grade. And he's staring at a screen and he's going, what the hell am I doing here? I was going to be somebody. I was going to be a jet pilot or I was going to own a bunch of real estate or I was going to be a corporate executive or I was going to sail around the world. But here I am instead. And I said, guys, you don't want to be that guy because that guy is your dad and you have got to get farther than I have. Now, those are the four things I tried to teach him. And as you as you see, I didn't spare myself at all. And that kind of honesty, you talk about building that presence with your kids. If you're that honest, they'll follow you to the end of the world. Hmm. I mean, I, I love it in, in so many ways. I've said it all, a couple of times already, um, but I just want to recap this. So number one, personal courtesy. Number two, um, confidence. Number three was resilience. Number four was ambition. That was right. your four pronged um, focus in terms of the, I'm going to say that the characteristics that you wanted to develop in your children. And Correct. maybe um, we could talk about this because this came up recently in just, just some content I was consuming. It's the idea of character because that's oh, yeah. really what, what I'm hearing. Would you talk about the importance uh, or how, where character was in terms of within your strategy and the importance of what you wanted to see? You bet. I think character begins with the first one, just that personal conduct, that courtesy. And, you know, character is something that any kid has to have and can develop. You know, 
I will tell you in talking with dads and moms all the time, we'll be talking about kids and they'll say, well, you know, J- Johnny, Johnny and Betty, they're really smart, you know, and I have to say, and you guys have already seen, I'm pretty unfiltered guy. Um, at my age, where I am, I can afford to be unfiltered. And I say, you know, I, I really don't care about how smart Johnny is. I said, but can he follow through? Can Johnny turn a light on in a room? What I mean by that is follow through is a fundamental part of that character. The idea of being able to do something and complete it, complete a task. And the person who has that reflex in completing a task is already far ahead of other kids. You know, it's an old athletic, you know, saying repetition builds character. You mentioned the word character. Repetition, that is reflex. That means doing things over and over again the right way. That will build character in every aspect. And the kid doesn't have to be an athlete or a ballerina or on stage, or as again, like with the robotics club, but just that ability to follow through on things, that's real character. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I just, Dad, I'll give it to you in a second. I just wanted to recap some of the key things that were mentioned before in your stories about your strategy. Some things that I heard, you know, really the power of using example, right? So there are examples yeah. around us, both good and bad, and they're both valuable because that's what I heard you doing and pointing that out to your children. So that's, I think, something important. Um, the idea of similar teachable moments. Yeah, you know, where these things come up in life, the, the example of, you know, you lost your job and your son's his your reaction. And then that also comes with the idea of helping our children gain perspective. Right. Of course, age and stage is going to be relevant and important, but that's the other thing is, you know, an important role is we can help our children gain perspective on these life events that I think really help reinforce or, you know, maybe create some of the negative perceptions that they may then grow into adulthood. And so the importance and value of being able to help our children gain perspective through the different elements of life and how that contributes to, I think, resilience, um, as well as maybe even driving some of their ambition. So uh, those are the the couple of things that really stood out to me. I just want to mention it and say, I, I think that's so, so valuable. I like your word. Your perspective is a better word than the one I use, frankly. It is, you know, always with my kids, it was the long game, man. You know, don't worry about heaving one into the end zone on anything. Just move the chains, move the Mm. chains every day and you're going to be fine. Again, that's that consistency. That's that character. But perspective is the best word. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ed. Yeah. Um, In your book, Four Lessons from My Three Sons, How You Can Raise Resilient Kids, I'd like you to just share with our family here the importance of parents learning from their kids. Right. Right? No question. No question. And like, again, in Four Lessons from My Three Sons, there's at least three three portions of it in which, you know, I got shut down by my kids. And... I learned. And, you know, I was once I was goading one of the eldest son about doing, you know, running for office at school. And I kept banging on him, you know, you'd be a great candidate. You know, you got a lot of friends. You're good on your feet, you know. And I kept nagging him. And finally, he just turned to me one day when I was in the midst of it. And he said, Dad, I know what I'm doing. And I just took this big breath breath. And I thought, man, you know, he's right. I got to shut up. Um, He's right. And I'm wrong. So yeah, I learned, you know, from the kids. Uh, Another time we were, they, they were invited to participate in this girls school uh, production of Pirates of Penzance. And they were at the boys school that was this, and the sister school was having it. And they were in seventh grade. And I said, hey, man, you guys got to volunteer for this, you know, this theatrical production. It'll look great on your record. And they go, you know, no, we're not doing this. I said, oh, come on, guys, you know, you know, kind of the faint number two. Hey, you know, you're used to being in front of 200 people at a time and half of them are screaming at you to fail, which, of course, if you're in a game, it's the opponent's parents are ragging you. 
And they said, no, we're not doing it. And I said, OK, here's here it is. Third time. I said, look, I'll give you 10 bucks if you just show up. And if you don't like it, I'll be waiting outside. You know, you can come out. So I took them there and they got out of the car and they had their ten dollar bills in their pocket. And I just took off and came back two and a half hours later. And they walked out and they were wearing pirate uniforms and um, <laughs> hats and they had the swords, you know, plastic swords. And they just get in the car and I said, oh, I'm glad I didn't wait too long. And they go, Dad, we knew you'd left. We knew you were going to leave. We knew you were putting us up to this. You know, this was a test. OK. And they had me. I mean, the idea was you, you you can't fool them. These these kids had me. And, you know, I felt kind of ashamed that I just left them. But the other part of it was, you know, they knew me well enough, like the kids shutting me down on dad. I know what I'm doing, you know, and if a parent doesn't learn from a kid, that parent's in myopia land, because if you are close enough with your kid, there's going to be things that they need to tell you that you don't want to hear, but you have to. Very true. Uh, I'm going to ask you this because you've had a great journey with your kids through fatherhood. What is your lens on the state of fatherhood at this time? Wow. You know, I'd love to quote something from Dad Central website. <laughs> I, I think the fact that your website exists shows that it's, you know, fathers have a lot of questions and they're searching a lot. I know if when my kid, let's say my kid, the eldest was four, I would have gone to your website and I would have got some damn good advice. Uh, today, I would think that there's a lot of dads going to your website because uh, things are kind of erratic and rocky and unsettled now in families in Canada and here in the United States, everywhere. I will tell you what my one, the one piece of advice, and it goes right back to Drew's opening about that Instagram post. That post was prompted by the release of a book 72 hours ago called The Anxious Generation by Dr. Jonathan Haidt. And the premise of the book is, is that social media and devices, and Drew held up his phone at the time, uh, have had a paralyzing effect on young people. And Dr. Haidt's book is full of stats and one of the stats was what Drew Brood brought up about self-harm among young girls. But the other stats are incontrovertible. Um, you know, by 2010 to 2011, the flip phone vanished and the iPhone from 2007, 2008 became a huge marketing success among younger people, not just adults. And from that moment on, the culture started to change all the way up to today when Drew was quoting those self-harm statistics. And here are some other statistics. Eight hours and 47 minutes is what a typical kid age 10 to 18 spends on a device. That doesn't include schoolwork. Two hours, 13 minutes a day is what an average boy ages 14 to 24 spends on video games. Two and a half, two hours, 13 minutes a day. Half of all kids between the ages of 12 and 20 have had a major depressive episode within the last 10 years. Dr. Haight in the book, of which that TikTok um, post was a part of, explains that social media and devices, this passive universe of just, you know, digesting information has really, really harmed the mental health of kids. That to me is the biggest challenge of fatherhood and parenting today. And there are ways to easily stop it and reverse it. That would be, you know, my, my culprit, so to speak. Good stuff, Drew. Well, I mean, those stats are, I think, speak for themselves. And thank you so much for adding that in there. Little did I know I was connected to, you know, the key things that you're already aware of. And, you know, I would imagine sharing this message broadly as well. To me, um, 
you know, Ed and I did a, a show a while ago about a, a study that showed how as little as 10 minutes a day of a father interacting with his child in a playful, creative, fun way, the difference it made to their academic performance, yeah, uh, as well as others. And so, you know, you're you're talking about eight hours and forty seven minutes in front of a device, and like that's average, like that's it's mind boggling, and that's not even including homework. Yet, when you counteract that with just ten minutes a day of one on one dedicated connection between a father and a child and parents, like moms and kids as well. Look at the difference it makes. And so this problem, it's not going away, but there's a solution. There is a solution. And we are the solution as parents. We are the solution. And it's not that crazy to invest 10, 15, 20 minutes of uninterrupted focus time on your child and see the difference it makes 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road and put some limits on these devices don't right. give your kids carte blanche to whatever they want and make yeah. sure that there's clarity in terms of no way you're not getting this here's what you're getting we're going for a hike we're going this anyways don't get me started but i just want to say i fully believe in and support that message and i think their solution is right in front of us it is and you know i wrote a book previous to the second edition it was called your kids rebound from pandemic lockdowns, a family guide to restoring your family. Mm. The, the biggest, the biggest catastrophe from COVID was the isolation of kids, the closing of schools, the quarantines, the shutting off of all extracurricular activities. But all of it led to increased use of cell phones, already accelerating from like around seven hours in 2019 to the, you know, eight hours 47 today. And you got to wonder what chunk of time that is in a kid's day that's more time than they spend sleeping and of course i'm the parents aren't off the hook parents have that damn phone in their hands all the time that was another time my kids called me you know i was banging on the idea of social media way back when they were young they didn't have phones until they were at the end of 11th grade they did, had one hour of video games a week. It was on the weekend, so they never got to use it because they were at games. We had no television in the house until they were in 10th grade. They didn't get any kind of the screen, you know, um, tornado, tidal wave of stuff that kids got that were their same ages. But one, you know, there I am on my phone. I have a pretty big job in D.C., and I'm on my phone. And one, one time, at one point, we're playing basketball on the driveway, and the kid goes, the middle kid goes, Dad, you're always on your phone. And I said, man, you know what? You're exactly right. Th- I'm ashamed because I've been yank- banging on you kids not to use them, and you don't even have them at this point. And here I am fiddling on a screen. And I said, that's it. I said, I'm not going to do it again. And I can tell you, for the next eight years, I maybe took that phone out in front of them, you know, a half a dozen times. I just would not answer stuff until I could get away and start to, you know, do the work stuff. So it's a parent's thing as well. And again, I got nailed by my kids and I learned from them and I deserved it. It's easy for kid parents. All you do is, and I, you know, maybe again, and this is not, this is unfiltered. You're the parent, they're the kid. You take the phone away and you say, there's going to be rules on this from now on. And the rules are, you can't pull it out in the car, at the dinner table, after 7.30 at night. We're turning off the routers. You can't go, as you said, Drew, the um, the boundaries. You can't go on these sites. Uh, and if you do, we're, you won't see that damn thing for a week. So, you know, parents have to step up. And at the same time, they got to step up and put their own phones down. Yeah, great, great message. Um, you know, we have to model it ourselves first. You know, the yeah. John Mac- John Maxwell has a simple saying: "So you know, the most basic leadership principle is people do what people see." <laughs> so, what are yeah, your yeah. kids seeing? And the more that you can model the type of behavior you're looking for them, importance. The other thing that you've you've mentioned, but we haven't explicitly said, is the humility 
to be willing to listen to our children and oh, yeah. hear their thoughts, their perspective, their ideas, or their rebuttals or their rebukes, we'll say. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. that if you're not able to hear your child, like your son saying, Dad, I know what I'm doing, and you recognize right. at that point, okay, <laughs> he's got this. I'm gonna yeah. step back because he's telling me I should step back. And so actually follow through and do right. that. Not get caught up in this idea of well, I'm the authority. I'm the the boss. You do what I say. Don't you argue with me? So there's authority, but then there's also respect. And I think being able to balance those and, and have your child feel respected and that you are willing to hear them so that they'll be willing to hear you. Anyways, just some thoughts there. Ed. I also want to compliment you on your humility. And I think being a dad, you got to have some sense of humility too. You don't know everything. You can't be everything. Admit when you're not right. Oh gosh. Yes, Ed. Oh yeah. You know, I'll tell you what, Ed, Andrew, humility is power under control. Okay. And I always told that to the kids, you know, and they could barely understand it when they were young. What the hell do those words mean? When they got older, they got it. I, Humility is power under control. Walk your life, walk your walk with just that steady, steadfast confidence in yourself and don't advertise it and you'll be fine. So, I mean, yeah, I got, I was embarrassed. I mean, the, the, none of these were pretty and they made me feel pretty bad. But, you know, to go back what Drew said, you got to be willing to listen to them if you're going to be continually directing them and what they should do. Well, Jeff, uh, this has been, Ed, did you want to go in? Sorry, I was about to. One last thing. Uh, Probably you're not going to outlive your sons. No. (laughs) But I was hoping for the best. Um, (laughs) When you transition, what would you like your sons to say about you? as a dad. Oh, I think that's pretty easy. It's like when I showed him the book before it was even published, um, you know, they said, Hey dad, you told it like it is. And so I just know that when I'm, you know, gone and buried and (laughs) my urn is under my tool shed out in the backyard, you know, Um, (laughs) and they've inherited this property they'll always they'll always say you know he told it like it is and i can't you know that's they've i've said that early on to them you know your dad's just telling it like it is man you know no fairy tales you know ever and i think that's what they'll say um so i you know maybe that's not too elegant it's just maybe you should be Found it. I don't know. <laughs> That's good. Drew? Jeff, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, reaching out, for coming on our show, having this conversation, and of course, for the message that you're communicating through your book, through your platform, through just wherever you're able to share this message, because I think it's so important. I think it's so relevant. Um, so we like to finish off, though, with giving our listeners one more peace that they can take away. And so, you know, the title of your book is about raising resilient kids. And so, you know, what is one question dads can be asking themselves uh, about how to raise a resilient child? How much more time can I spend one-on-one or one-on-two with my children? Period. Mm-hmm. Powerful and important. I love that. And then what's one action step that they can then take to begin um, supporting their children becoming resilient adults. Okay. Unfiltered Nelly is going to be coming at both of you right now. Bring yank, it. <laughs> yank the phone out of their cold hand. Hmm. Awesome. Well, Jeff, <laughs> I love, I love that you tell it like it is. And to me, We need more of that. And um, it's just been an honor to have you share with us and to be part of the show. And I look forward to staying connected and supporting you and having us continue to, to be connected down the road. 
Oh, it's been a privilege and a pleasure. And Drew, thank you again. Before we let you go, where can people get a hold of you? Certainly. Uh, www.nelliganbooks.com. On Instagram at Nelligan underscore books. Twitter at Resilient Sons. And Facebook, Jeff Nelligan Books. And LinkedIn, just under my name. Well, Jeff, I want to, I want to thank you for your service as a dad to your country, to many parents alone around the world. And uh, this has been an outstanding conversation. And uh, I can only speak for myself. I've left better. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, that's high I've praise, man. High praise, yeah. Chief. I, wow. I, I left better. So if there's anything we can support you with down the road, please don't be afraid to reach. I have a feeling we're going to stay in contact. Well, I ain't going to. I know for sure because – I really I'd appreciate love it. We both appreciate it. And uh, so as always, don't just manage your time, manage your energy, and remember to give yourself grace. And thank you for the blessing you've provided today. Uh, thank you. Take care. All right, Drew. You got yourself on mute, Drew. There we go. You know, Ed, you said it at the beginning, it's going to be a great conversation. And this is why I really enjoy doing this work is having conversations with other men, other dads who uh, love their fatherhood role, who feel passionately about their fatherhood role, but are also very intentional about their fatherhood role and live it out on a daily basis. And so you know, there's a basic, you know, proverb that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And I, I think that's the, the, the honor and privilege of being able to do this is to be connected with other men who are doing this work and are living it out and inspiring me. Uh, and so I actually, as you said, I'm leaving the conversation better, but I'm, I'm just so energized by being, you know, in, just in conversation uh, about these topics that matter a lot to me. So that's all I can say is my wrap up. <laughs> well, all I will just add is Jeff to me is a true definition of not hard work, but heart work. That's what I leave with heart work, heart work to being the best dad, heart work being serving his heart work, his passion. You can tell that his passion is aligned with who he is. So I leave with that many times over. The Dad Central Show is sponsored by Dove Men Plus Care. Dove Men Plus Care believes that care is the best of a man because when men care for themselves and others, there's a positive impact. We'd love to hear from you via email, podcast at dadcentral.ca. Who would you like to have on? Would you like Jeff to come back and share some more? I do. And anything we can do to make elevation of fatherhood, male caregivers, a better thing for the world and for families. Also, listen to our podcast, dadcentral.ca forward slash podcast. And then finally, piles of free resources at the website, dadcentral.ca. So as always, want to say thank you for taking the most precious thing that you have time to listen to these conversations. Spread the word. And remember, don't just manage your time, manage your energy, and remember to give yourself grace. Thanks for listening, and be well.